Okay, so for the second talk today, it's great to have Tim Adamo here, who's going to tell us about the Park Taylor formula in higher dimensions. Okay, thanks very much. Uh, I am indeed Tim Adamo, uh, and if you didn't see the notice earlier, not Natalie Paquette, who will be talking uh, after after lunch. So uh, I'm going to tell you uh, a story about these words, but first I'm going to try uh, to tell you what some of these words mean. And I don't, for some of you, this is something that you, you wake up uh, knowing or have nightmares about. Uh, but for, 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 for others, maybe uh, you've never heard of the Park-Taylor formula, or you don't know what a scattering amplitude is. And I'll try to just get us uh, a bit on the same page about this before I start. But uh, I should also say that this is all the story I've been working with with uh, Houston Surubaru, who's an excellent graduate student in Edinburgh. He's set right there. And of course, he's been doing all the heavy lifting. So uh, if you have... Uh, questions or complaints, you should direct them all to you today uh, after the talk. So, uh, okay, so what is the Park-Taylor formula? This is a formula that uh, everyone should know or everyone should have seen at some point. It's a formula for what a physicist would call tree-level gluon scattering amplitudes. And it's not just any formula, it's a very remarkable formula. So first I'll try to explain to you what I mean by a tree-level gluon scattering amplitude, and then I'll try to explain to you why this formula has a name, why we think of it as being remarkable. So from the QFT Perspective. If you're a, if you're a physicist and you remember your Heskin and Schroeder, uh, a scattering amplitude this is just a, a probability amplitude for some in state in the asymptotic past. to evolve into an out state. In the asymptotic future. So you throw some stuff in, and you want to know what is the probability amplitude to get a certain set of stuff out. And uh, this probability amplitude is governed by the rich, in principle, very rich dynamical content uh, of your quantum field theory. But uh, you can also define these things at least order by order in perturbation theory in a way that doesn't use any fancy physics terminology and just has a completely, uh, if you like, variational definition. So uh, uh, in other words, uh, let's suppose we're given some theory in the form of a classical action function. Call this action S of phi. Phi looks like maybe it's meant to be a scalar, but it can be anything. Some collection of fields. Uh, this is a classical action. And the equations of motion uh, will look something like schematically some differential operator acting on phi plus a bunch of nonlinear terms. Let's say they start at order phi squared, and there's some parameter there that I'll call g, which physicists call the coupling constant, which is like keeping track of how nonlinear every term in these equations of motion is. And then we set this big PDE equal to 0. d, you should think in usually something like uh, a wave operator or, or a Laplacian. So to define a tree-level scattering amplitude, the first thing I need to talk about is what I mean by the in and the out states. So the in or out states is, this is just a collection we call them little phi 1 to little phi n of solutions 
the linearized equation of motion with appropriate boundary conditions. Right, so if we're doing scattering in empty Minkowski space, say, uh, physicists often like to work in momentum eigenstates, which is like kind of Fourier modes of solutions. So you might imagine you have something that looks like e to the plus or minus i k dot x, but then you want this thing to die off either at late times or early times, depending on whether it's outgoing or incoming. And so then maybe you add some kind of i epsilon prescription here. Uh, let's see, plus or minus. Long t. Okay. So the first thing I do is I solve the linearized equation of motion with whatever boundary conditions uh, I'm interested in for my scattering problem. I take a collection of these guys. Now, the real question is, if I write here, can you all see it? Yeah? The top half. The top half. Okay. All right. Okay. I'll keep it, uh, I'll keep it high. Uh, okay. So step one is we take this collection of linearized solutions, and we just uh, take a superposition of them. So let's let big phi 0n be a sum, i goes from 1 to n, of my scattering states, so my, my solutions, the linearized equations of motion, plus some formal parameters that I'll call uh, epsilon i. Now, We're going to recursively solve the nonlinear equations of motion order by order in this coupling constant G, starting with this superposition of linearized solutions. call big phi, say kn, the solution at order g to the k. Okay? So this is something that in principle is just algorithmic, albeit perhaps painful. It involves inverting this linear differential operator, and you just proceed order by order. Uh, solving the nonlinear equations of motion. Now, the definition of a tree level scattering amplitude, which I'll call m sub n, this is just I take my classical action and I evaluate it on one of these recursively constructed solutions to the equation of motion. The order I have to go uh, depends on, on n. So this goes up to, say, the maximum of 0 or n minus 3 for a theory whose first nonlinearity occur occurs at phi squared, say. If it was at phi cubed, this 3 would turn into a 4. And points, and then I take the multilinear piece in these formal parameters epsilon. And that's what a tree level scattering amplitude is. Okay? So you can show that this definition agrees with the, the LSZ definition of scattering amplitudes uh, at tree level. But something I quite like about this definition, this is sometimes called the perturbator definition of scattering amplitudes, uh, is that uh, you don't need to know any quantum field theory at all. You just need to know what an action functional is, and you need to know how to recursively solve equations of motion, starting with some uh, initial boundary conditions. That's not quite true. You need to know the two-point function. You need to, <laughs> yeah, okay, and you need to know something, uh, okay, so I would argue that this is actually a prescription uh, for the boundary conditions. The two-point function is a, I, I, I claim, without proof, that uh, knowing what you mean by the boundary conditions for your linearized solution actually tells you what the two-point function is because it's just given by evaluating. That's why there's a max of zero uh, there, so you don't get a negative number. You just take the quadratic part of the action and take the bilinear piece of it, and if you pick the boundary conditions right, this will give you a two-point function. 
Yeah, so, uh, so okay, so in some sense, uh, the upshot here is that tree level scattering amplitudes, these things I'll call MN, these are just multilinear pieces of the classical action evaluated on shell. So by on shell, I mean on a solution to the equations of motion. Okay? Now, I think this is a very kind of slick definition, but it doesn't make computing these things easy. Right? In general, extracting this multilinear piece of the action is really hard. And for a theory, say, that has uh, minimal Q, the, whose lowest valence nonlinearity is kind of quadratic in the equation of motion, or it has cubic interactions, uh, roughly as you turn n up, so the number of external states grows, the number of multilinear pieces you have to extract from this action grows roughly exponentially. So it gets out of hand quickly. Simon. Is it important if it's the action as opposed to the Lagrangian? Or in other words, do boundary terms matter in this approach? Uh, of, of course they do. And for it to be gauge invariant, it has to be the action, not the Lagrangian. Because the gauge transformation might generically lead to boundary terms. Or total derivatives at the level of Lagrangian, which shouldn't be contributing to the amplitude. Absolutely. And again, the way you deal with these boundary terms is dictated by the boundary conditions you use to solve the linear equation. Yeah, good question. Um, so yeah, so... so Although I think this gives a kind of nice variational definition of the scattering amplitude, it doesn't make computing them easy. And uh, for those who were here for Anastasia's talk on Monday, at some point there was some table and there were some numbers of things called Feynman diagrams that you'd have to draw to compute, uh, uh, say, uh, a scattering amplitude in the standard model uh, as a function of n, the number of external states. And like when n is 5, you get like 200. And when n is 6, you're like 600. And n is 7, you're already into the thousands. And these, these Feynman diagrams are like the terms that you need to extract uh, from the action when you take this multilinear piece. So in general, doing this computation is hard. And I don't mean hard for people, I mean hard for computers. So, uh, so, so this is a challenge uh, for, for theoretical physics to be able to extract these multilinear pieces of the action functional. And the, the reason why the Park-Taylor formula has a name is that it somehow resums an infinite number of these in a very special configuration. So sometimes miracles can happen. Okay, so where, what is the context uh, for this particular miracle I want to tell you about? The action we're going to be dealing with is the, the Yang-Mills action. This is a function of some gauge connection. There's some coupling constant. And I just take the trace of the field strength of the gauge connection. I wedge it against the Hodge star of the field strength. Okay, so this is the Yang-Mills action. And... Uh, Again, the lowest order interaction here is cubic, so you still have this exponential growth uh, in Feynman diagrams or in terms that are contributing to, uh, to scattering amplitudes in this variational definition. So this looks, uh, looks like a nightmare, but uh, let's, let's try and go through uh, the yoga of this prescription. So what's the first thing we need to do if we want to compute scattering amplitudes in Yang-Mills theory? Uh, we need to look at linearized solutions to the Yang-Mills equations. Well, this is just the Maxwell equations because we've linearized. And these are some gauge potentials. They carry an adjoint index uh, for the gauge group, so some Lie algebra index. So they can be given by some generator, of the Lie algebra of the gauge group, some vector, some constant vector, which we call the polarization. And then in a momentum eigenspace, Eigenstate basis, there's some oscillator, say e to the i k dot x. I'm not going to be careful about signs uh, up here. And uh, the equations of motion and gauge fixing conditions tell you that k squared is equal to zero. Let's say we have some 
Lorentz gauge conditions that this polarization is transverse uh, to the momentum. There's still a residual gauge degree of freedom which we can fix by imposing some light front gauge. So pick some null vector that isn't k and ask that the polarization is transverse to that. So in four dimensions, there are two degrees of freedom left in this epsilon mu, right? So it starts out as four degrees of freedom, but then I have two gauge fixing conditions. Okay. And it can be useful to organize these into what physicists call a helicity basis. So this is just, uh, well, with an appropriate choice of frequency, or if you like, sign for the energy component of this momentum vector k, this, this idea of helicity basis is just a decomposition into self-dual and anti-self-dual degrees of freedom at the level of the linearized field strength of this perturbation, this linearized solution to the Yang Mills equation. So this is the same as decomposing this epsilon mu into self-dual and anti-self-dual degrees of freedom. And then something you can do is you can start grading your scattering amplitudes by this decomposition. Okay, so uh, I should also say that this, this linearized solution uh, of the Yang-Mills equations, this is what a physicist calls a gluon. Okay, so it's just fancy speak for a linearized solution of the Yang-Mills equation. So now we can grade our scattering amplitude by this uh, helicity, or if you like, self-duality, decomposition. So what do I mean by that? I mean, if you've specified the external states, so the collection of gluons, you, you want to be the external states in your scattering problem, these things come with a label which is just a plus or a minus, whether their linearized field strength is self-dual or anti-self-dual. Right? So you can start saying, let me consider the endpoint tree-level scattering amplitude where none of the external gluons is anti-self-dual. <laughs> then you can take the case where one of them <coughs> is anti-self-dual, and so on and so forth. Okay, and this gives a complete grading of the scattering amplitude because every external gluon has to be one or the other in this basis. Okay, now you can show that the first two uh, classes here are always zero. This is already impressive because it's an all multiplicity result for the scattering amplitudes. So M N zero, this is always zero, and M N one, this is always zero. There are various ways to show this, but in some sense, uh, these are a consequence uh, of the consistency and integrability of the self-dual sector of Yang-Mills. So in some sense, these are already impressive results from the naive definition uh, of, a, of a scattering amplitude. You've taken uh, some multilinear piece of the action with some appropriate boundary conditions. There will be many, many terms for generic n contributing to this. Any one of them will not be zero, but their sum somehow always conspires to be zero in these helicity sectors. 
But then once you get to the case where there are two negative felicity or anti-self-dual external gluons, you lose these widgets that allow you to kill uh, all of these amplitudes. And this guy isn't constrained. It's not generically zero. And this is what physicists call the maximal felicity violating sector, or MHV sector. Okay. So now we can get to the Mark Taylor formula. Boundary conditions for which the first two identities uh, A? Yes. ADS is a good example. So here I always have in mind an actual scattering problem that's asymptotically <laughs> flat. Okay, so all right, let's do a sequence. So uh, okay, so the last couple of ingredients we need to state what this part Taylor formula are the following. So in 4D, I can replace any, uh, any kind of tensor index by a pair of SL2C spinner indices of opposite chirality. And I raise and lower these spinner indices using the SL2 invariant tensors, which are just the two-dimensional levi, two levi Civita symbols. And so if this guy is null, it means that this 2 by 2 matrix, k alpha alpha dot, uh, has co-rank 1. And that means that it can be written uh, in terms of two spinners, one of each chirality. If I ask for this to be Lorentzian real, they're related by complex conjugation. But uh, let's, let's just let this be a complex four vector for now. And we can give some notation, which is useful for SL2 invariant inner products. Angle bracket ij, this is just, say, kappa i alpha, kappa j alpha, which is just epsilon uh, uh, beta alpha, kappa i alpha, kappa j beta. So the Park-Taylor formula, well, let me say one more thing. So it's a consequence of the Fiertz identity that for gluon scattering amplitudes, because every external gluon comes with the generator of the Lie algebra of the gauge group, it's a simple fact that these multilinear pieces of the action will always be built out of structure constants of the Lie algebra concatenated together. And then you can repeatedly apply the Fiertz identity to show that these things can always be written as a sum over non-cyclic permutations of traces. So let's call our non-cyclic permutation little sigma. Traces of generators of the Lie algebra of the gauge group times something interesting, which is the kinematic, where all the kinematics or dynamics is lurking. This guy is called the color ordered partial amplitude. And the Park-Taylor formula is an expression for this color-ordered partial amplitude in this maximal helicity violating configuration for any n. Okay. So a n2, you have some momentum conserving delta function. And then let's say our two negative helicity gluons, let's call them r and s. I get angle bracket r s to the fourth over a cyclic product of all the angle brackets. One, two, two, three, all the way up to n. Okay, so that's the Park-Taylor form. So again, in the language that uh, we've introduced, this is a formula for some multilinear piece of the Yang-Mills action evaluated on shell where the boundary conditions are such that two of the scattering states have negative felicity or uh, anti-self-dual. Their linearized field strength is anti-self-dual. Now, okay, it's a cute formula, but I really want to hammer home. This is a formula that's true for any n. So it's resumming an infinite number of Feynman diagrams or an infinite number uh, of 
contributions to this multilinear piece of the action. So it really looks uh, miraculous. And people understood it was miraculous at the time it was written down. And in fact, uh, if you've heard of something called Behrens Gila recursion, which is still today uh, the way that real physicists compute scattering amplitudes, like at the LHC, for instance, this was essentially invented to check this formula uh, to show that it was correct. And I should also point out, it's kind of interesting, the way Park and Taylor guessed this is they did a hard computation at six points, essentially by hand. And then they just spotted a pattern and guessed that the pattern extended to all n. And it, it, it has features that tell you it's a good guess, but uh, it's not immediately obvious it should be true. OK, so the question. Adam? Yes? Does Berens kill a word beyond MHV? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's much more general than an, than an MHV thing. It's like a, in a way, it's like an implementation of this perturbator definition. I mean, that's true, but Behrens Gila recursion is something that doesn't have anything to do with self dual Yang mills. In the self dual sector, this is what it gives you. Okay, so this formula was written down in like 1986. And it's been extremely motivating for people studying scattering amplitudes uh, for the last, well, 30 going on 40 years. And so there's a natural question, which is, are there other formulae like it? Are there other miracles that happen when we consider perturbative quantum field theories uh, that we're interested in, like Yang-Mills theory? So, Are there other examples of the Park-Taylor formula? And to answer this question, one has to first think about why this miracle happened in 4D in Yang-Mills theory, right? You know, miracles are great, but we're not interested in miracles per se. We're under interested in understanding why they're not miracles, why they actually happen. So to answer this question, we have to first think about why a formula like that for gluon scattering in Yang-Mills theory in four dimensions can exist. So why does the Park-Taylor formula exist in the first place? Well, uh, in a way, this comes back to Simone's uh, questions about uh, boundary conditions and how they impact or don't impact this procedure of extracting multilinear pieces from an action functional. So, uh, in, in 4D, I can consider a topological action, which people sometimes call the theta term, which is just given by taking the integral of the trace of the field strength of my gauge connection wedged against itself. Okay? It's well known that this is a topological uh, invariant, and that means that it won't <coughs> affect perturbation theory when I have asymptotically flat boundary conditions. That's because when I go to extract this multilinear piece of the action functional, contributions from this dude are always going to be total derivatives. And if I have asymptotically flat boundary conditions, those will drop out. Okay. So adding this theta term to the Yang-Mills action doesn't change these tree-level scattering amplitudes, OK? So what you can do is you can pick in a very auspicious multiple of this theta term to add to the Yang-Mills action. So you can take the Yang-Mills action, and you can say subtract 1 over 2 g squared s theta from it. And then it's not hard to convince yourself that what you're left with it's just 1 over g squared integral trace f minus wedge f minus, where f minus is the anti-self dual part of the field strength. Okay? 
So by adding this topological term, I can rewrite the Yang-Mills action in such a way that it only depends on the anti-self-dual part of the field string. You might say, okay, who cares? Well, the reason why this is a good thing to do is it allows you to organize the perturbative expansion in G, in the coupling constant, around the self-dual sector of the theory. So uh, this integral of trace f minus wedge f minus 1 over g squared, I can introduce a Lagrange multiplier and just rewrite this as integral trace some b wedge f minus minus g squared over 2 integral trace b wedge b. For Lagrange multiplier b, an anti-self-dual 2 form, say I'm in Minkowski space, uh, valued in the Lie algebra of the gauge group. Okay? So now the equations of motion are just that f minus is equal to g squared b, and b is covariantly closed. And that means that for small g, which is what we're doing when we're doing perturbation theory, we're expanding around the sector where f minus is equal to zero, and that's the self-dual sector. Okay? So again, who cares? What does this have to do with the Park-Taylor formula? Remember, the Park-Taylor formula is a formula for amplitudes that have two anti-self-dual guys and arbitrarily many self-dual guys. And that's now generated by precisely this term in the action. This is now a generating functional for the MHV amplitudes. So why? It's quadratic in B, which is now the thing that's encoding the anti-self-dual or negative helicity degrees of freedom. And the B's equation of motion is that it's a linear anti-self-dual field propagating on a nonlinear self-dual background for small g. Okay? So this generating functional, I said, think of it as trace b wedge b, where the b's are living on a generic nonlinear self-dual background. And if I expand that background in uh, positive helicity gluons, in linearized self-dual gluons, I'll build uh, the MHV amplitude. And uh, I guess I should put some names to this stuff. So, so this, this form of the Yang-Mills action, uh, was, was first written down by Chalmers and Siegel in the 90s. And I think it's fair to say that, uh, well, Witten and Lionel were the first ones to realize the fact that you can, you can derive the MHV amplitudes from this thing as a generating functional. The reason why is because it can be lifted up to twister space, where the self-dual sector is essentially trivialized, or perturbatively expanding around it is, is sort of a linear problem. Okay, so... To answer the question, are there other examples of the Park-Taylor formula, we need to find other scenarios where things like this happen, where we can perturbatively expand the field theory we're interested in around some integrable sector where we know how to do the expansion. Okay? So an answer to this question, which I'm going to give, involves a, a slight detour now into uh, hyper geometry, which is something we've heard about loads this week, so I'll be very cursory, and in fact, the hyperkähler geometry I need is not very sophisticated. So, in 4M dimensions, we're going to say a manifold M or MG is hyperkähler if the holonomy of the metric is contained in SPM. Now, I'm going to be really sloppy about reality conditions here, so really, you can imagine this is a complexified hyperkähler 
structure, G is a holomorphic metric, and so I can allow the, the holonomy to be an SPMC. This induces what's called a, a paraconformal structure, or at least what I understand to be called a paraconformal structure. Which is just saying that the tangent bundle of my manifold can be split into the tensor product of two subbundles, S and S twiddle. S is a SL2 bundle with flat connection, and S twiddle is an SPM bundle with, in general, not flat connections. So that's where the interesting part of the, the curvature of the hypercalar manifold is living, is in the curvature of this S twiddle. So luckily, uh, the story I'm going to tell you about is just about gluon scattering in flat space, so we only need the flat model uh, of hyperkähler geometry. So we're just going to take flat case, this is just, again, in the holomorphic category, so complexified, this is just C4M, where uh, the hyperkähler structure, if you like, is encoded in the triplet of two forms, dx alpha alpha dot dx beta alpha dot. You can see that these things are closed, and they're going to induce the trio of com integral complex structures with quaternionic -like relations among them that is equivalent uh, to the hyperkähler condition. And as we've heard again many times this week, this flat hyperkähler manifold has a twister space associated with it. This is an open subset of CP 2M plus 1. So let me give some homogeneous holomorphic coordinates. I'll call them ZA. I can split them into 2M numbers plus another two numbers. Remember, this is an SPM index. This is an SL2 index. So think of these as homogeneous coordinates on CP 2M plus 1. And I remove the CP 2M minus 1 where both of the lambda guys vanish. Okay, so this has a vibration, a holomorphic vibration over P1, which is just given by sending ZA to lambda alpha. And because we've removed uh, the subvariety where both lambdas vanish, uh, these are good holomorphic homogeneous coordinates on the Riemann sphere. Okay? And the relation between the hyperkähler manifold C4M and this twister space is given by holomorphic curves in the twister space. So an X in C4M corresponds to a line given by, if you like, the incidence relations X alpha dot equals X alpha alpha dot lambda alpha. In the twister space. Okay, this is a story we've heard many times this week, uh, but just to get us all on the same page. Now, what I'm going to be interested in are certain gauge bundles over this hyperkähler manifold.
So let's consider a, a principal G bundle over C for M connection. The curvature of this connection is a two form that's valued in the Lie algebra, or the complexified Lie algebra of G, right? So using my paraconformal structure, this two form, it has a pair of a pair of indices. Remember, the undotted indices are SL2 indices. The dotted indices are SPN indices. And because it's a two form, it's anti-symmetric. And we can now start decomposing this thing into irreducibles of SL2 and SPN. So F alpha alpha dot beta beta dot, because it's skew under interchanges of the pairs, it can be skew under interchange of, say, the SL2 indices. And in that case, there's a unique thing it can be proportional to, which is the SL2 invariant, epsilon alpha beta times some symmetric object that I'll call f twiddle alpha dot beta dot, or it can be skew under the dotted guys. And in that case, it can be proportional to the symplectic form on uh, SP of SPM, so epsilon alpha dot beta dot, times some symmetric quantity that I'll call f hat. But when m is greater than 1, it doesn't have to be proportional to this, because there's trace-free, uh, the, the skew symmetric representation uh, of SP M has trace-free bits, so there's other stuff you can have. Let me call it F check, alpha beta, alpha dot, beta dot, where epsilon alpha dot beta dot contracted into F check is equal to zero, and F check is, uh, let me abuse notation here, it's symmetric on the undotted indices and skew on the dotted indices. Okay, so in 4D, for m is equal to 1, I wouldn't have this guy, right, because the decomposition uh, is, is unique on the skew symmetric bit. But for, for m greater than 1, I also have, uh, also have this dude to worry about. <coughs> so now, we're going to define a certain class of gauge bundles over C4M. So we're going to definition. We'll call a bundle hyperholomorphic if the irreducibles f hat and f check vanish. Okay, so this definition uh, was written down by Richard Ward in a paper in 1983, and then mathematicians seem to have rediscovered it in the mid-90s. And their definition is in some sense more general. It's on any hyperkähler manifold. It's a, a bundle whose field strength is a 1 1 form with respect to every complex structure of the hyperkähler manifold. But the definitions are equivalent. And as far as I can tell, none of the mathematicians ever seems to cite this Ward paper. But uh, it predates them by uh, 15 years at least. So, uh, okay, so um, great. Uh, who cares? Why, why, why do we care? Well, the first reason to care is that uh, this hyperholomorphic condition always implies that the gauge field is Yang Mills. Okay, so in for m equal one, this is a well-known fact. Uh, you have a self-dual gauge field; it's always Yang Mills because the Bianchi identity is then equivalent to the Yang Mills equation. But in fact, it's true for four m m greater than one for exactly the same reason. So uh, the holonomy conditions. Uh, or if you like, the, the hyperkähler of C4M means that there exists a 
a totally skew rank four tensor or a four form if you like, call it theta ABCD, uh, which is totally skew. And uh, you can define it in terms of its action on vector fields. So let's say A, B, C, D, W, A, X, B, Y, C, Z, D. This is just in the paraconformal structure, W alpha alpha dot, X alpha beta dot, Y beta alpha dot, Z beta beta dot. Okay. And... Uh, you can consider this, this thing because it's skew and rank four. It defines a linear map on two forms. So you can consider it acting on the field strength of your gauge bundle in 4M dimensions. There's, okay, to get the numbers to be right, there has to be a one eighth here. Don't ask me why. It's just algebra. So uh, you get a decomposition into eigenspaces depending on which irreducible you look at, basically. So, what you find is 3 alpha beta f twiddle alpha dot beta dot minus 2m plus 1 epsilon alpha dot beta dot f hat alpha beta minus f check alpha beta alpha dot beta dot. Okay? But now uh, the Bianchi identity tells you that if I have theta a, b, c, d, I take covariant derivative B, F, C, D. This has to always vanish, just as a consequence of the Bianchi identity. But now if I restrict this to the hyperholomorphic sector, this is equivalent to the condition D alpha beta dot F twiddle alpha dot beta dot is equal to zero. And this is just the Yang-Mills equation in the HH sector. It's really the same story. Hyperholomorphic bundles are always Yang, hyperholomorphic connections are always Yang Mills because of the Bianchi identity. By the way, you were asking why don't why don't mathematicians here that work is earlier than mathematicians? I think Salomon was doing these things in the early 80s. Okay, okay, so Salomon even earlier. Okay. Uh, His thesis what was on I okay. Scale manifolds. Like does Verbitsky cite him or is it just uh, these are I, disconnected I, I, uh, probably. Okay, okay. But he has a, you know, a nice survey book even by the late 80s, which does. Okay. Yeah. Um, this is a theta? Yes, this, this, this object. I mean, it, 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 it's the analog if you have in the, in, the, in the real kind of setting, you would think of it as omega 1 squared plus omega 2 squared plus omega 3 squared. But you can actually formulate it. This is all being done in the complexified setting. Mm. Oh. That even survives in the quaternion Kaler. In the parallel. Even for quick quaternion Kaler, manifolds of time does not, if the scalar privilege is non zero, you put in a parallel four point. Either two points or not. Parallel four points. So parallel four points. Okay, so one reason to care about these uh, hyperholomorphic bundles is that they're automatically Yang Mills. Whoa! Uh, but then the uh, the other reason to care is that uh, Yang Mills theory on okay C for M again. I'm thinking of everything complexified, but we can pick real slices if we want. Uh, this admits. A perturbative expansion around the hyperholomorphic sector. In exactly the same way that in 4D, Yang Mills theory admitted a perturbative expansion around the self dual sector. So, why is this? Well, you can take the Yang Mills action and you can subtract from it an appropriate multiple of the following quantity. How many helicities are there? Good. So uh, l l let me finish this and then give you an answer to this. You 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 you've spotted uh, some trickery. Uh, 
I can add and subtract multiples of two copies of the field strength hooked into this four form. Because it's totally skewed, this is a total derivative. And again, with asymptotically flat boundary conditions, it's not going to touch perturbation theory. And if you do this, what you find is m into m. Ooh, yeah. 2m plus 1 for 3 g squared integral d4m x trace f hat alpha beta f hat alpha beta plus whatever 6 g squared integral. Okay, so in particular you can remove the hyperholomorphic, sorry, maybe people can't see that. The hyperholomorphic field strength uh, from the Yang-Mills action, the same way that you can remove the self-dual part of the field strength uh, from the Yang-Mills action in four dimensions. Okay. Now, Otto had a prescient question, which is how many polarization degrees of freedom do you have here? So in 4D, this hyperholomorphic sector just was the self-dual sector, and that was one of the two on-shell degrees of freedom in the gluon. However, uh, you can just count the number of equations that we have here defining the hyperholomorphic sector here for m greater than 1. So in general, this is 3 times m into 2m minus 1 uh, equations, and this massively over-constrains the gauge field for m greater than 1. Right? So in 4m dimensions, the gauge field should have 4m minus 2 on-shell degrees of freedom. That number is generically smaller than 3m into 2m minus 1 okay, for m greater than 1. When m is, when m is, uh, is equal to 1, they're the same. Right, but, uh, so these hyperholomorphic degrees of freedom should not be thought of as polarizations. They're constraints on polarizations in higher numbers of dimensions. But you can still organize perturbation theory uh, by expanding around this sector. Because now, all we need to do is exactly the same trick uh, that we did in 4D. Introduce some Lagrange multipliers, and we get an action that's d4m x trace, uh, say, b hat alpha beta. Uh, so this, I don't actually know the answer to this. Maybe some, I mean, it's a total derivative, but I don't know if you would call it topological. It's not the second term class. It's no, it's not. It doesn't give topological invariance. I think this is name, right? The, maybe, oh, sorry, I should defer to the to the experts. Well, Peter's not topological. No. But, uh, However, it, it, but the point is that it, it has a well-defined Duran class, or it, right, the general right, right, right. So you, you can have a preparing of a, a well-defined Duran class with. I see. Yeah. So thesis closed. Yes. And and and, fact, and, 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 and I see. So so it's closed and parallel. So but it's in fact the, 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 for, for this purpose, the main thing is it's, it's closed, and then you can yeah. You can, which, so I think it's, it's I think it's actually. Uh, it's expressible in terms of Pontryagin classes. I think it's. Oh, ah, okay. So there's a. Okay, so even even better than uh than than than, than I'm claiming. But anyway, dropping it doesn't change the equations much. No, that's the, the, the main point is with yeah. asymptotically flat boundary conditions. It, you know, okay, it never never changes the equations of motion, and with asymptotically flat boundary conditions, it's never going to touch this yeah. process of extracting multilinear pieces. So in, in fact, the, the point is that the Hodge star of theta is uh, a uh, is the wedge product of theta with itself an appropriate number of times, and then you compare that with the first Pontryagin class. I see. Okay. Okay. That would be the. Which you know, you would want to do that in the real setting, otherwise then the, the complexified setting is sort of becomes. Yeah. 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 <laughs> so you get. Uh, you can just introduce Lagrange multipliers b hat and b check, 
and then you know you'll get some actions that are like uh, trace uh, b hat squared plus trace b check squared. Let me not be uh, careful about the details in light of time. And the the punchline is that now you can partially grade your scattering amplitudes by the number of hyperholomorphic external or non-hyperholomorphic external gluons they have. This is now not a total grading like it was in 4D for precisely this reason. Saying that a gluon is not hyperholomorphic doesn't actually constrain its polarization degrees of freedom because the hyperholomorphicity condition is over constraining for m greater than one. So you get a, a partial grading of your amplitudes uh, by doing this. And uh, for exactly the same reasons as in 4D, the amplitude uh, with no non-hyperholomorphic external gluons is always zero. The amplitude with one of them is always zero. And this, you start getting things that are non-trivial precisely when there's two of them, again. So now you might call MHV maximally hyperholomorphicity violating. And for certain kinematics, this, so, so, so we can get an exact formula for this uh, by lifting the bits of the action that are quadratic in B to the twister space of C4M. But I'll just end with this little uh, thing, which is that for, for specific kinematics, this amplitude is really literally equal to part Taylor. But that's when you haven't chosen the most general polarizations for the non uh, hyperholomorphic gluons uh, and, and, and their momenta. But uh, the point is that the part Taylor formula exists in higher numbers of dimensions, but it's intimately tied to these sort of twistorial constructions that are linked with hypercalarity and hyperholomorphicity. There's a uh, well, I should stop here, but uh, there's, there's a, a chiral algebra for those who know about these things associated with these sectors, which is just the loop algebra of Lie algebra-valued polynomials on C2M, so LG bracket C2M. Uh, and uh, yeah, somehow this is still an algebra that you should think of as coming from a two-dimensional CFT. So there's some slight mystery there for people who've drank the celestial... Uh, holography Kool-Aid. But uh, yeah, I'll stop there. Thanks very much. So this Park Taylor, you, I mean, in this particular center, it's not just a dimensional reduction. No, that's the, the, it's, it's important to emphasize that that's not the case. So the reason why I said this for certain kinematics thing is you have to think about how to write a null vector in 4M dimensions that respects this hyperkähler structure, this paraconformal structure. And so one way to do it is you have k alpha alpha dot is equal to uh, a sum of two simple null vectors, right? So you can have some kappa alpha a, uh, kappa twiddle alpha dot a, where a goes from one to two. And then the con you get a constraint here, which is that the square bracket, if you like, of kappa twiddle one kappa twiddle 2 has to vanish. And if you count the number of degrees of freedom here, this is exactly 4m minus 1 that's left over. So this is a good parameterization. But uh, I mentioned that, um, OK, so, so the point is, if I only had one term here, that vector would be null. But for m greater than 1, not every null vector is simple anymore, because the symplectic form on SPM is not the unique skew symmetric object. Um, so 
It turns out that if you start writing down, trying to write down momentum eigenstates for a hyperholomorphic gluon, it forces the momentum to be simple. So you cover up this little a. <laughs> and that's precisely because it's an over-constraining condition. So for this Park-Taylor configuration, this MHV configuration, most of the external gluons are parameterized by a single undotted spinner and a single dotted momentum spinner. And so you know what you mean by angle brackets. It's only the non-hyperholomorphic gluons where you have this non-simple momentum. But you can also choose their momentum to be simple. And then the formula you get is literally the Park-Taylor the park formula. When, when you don't make that last choice? When you don't make that last choice, in some sense we're, so we have, we have guesses for the formula for generic kinematics, which we believe to be right. But uh, this is something for the aficionados in the crowd. We, we don't know how to write them down on twister space uh, yet. And it's just, it's a really simple, um, I would love to hear if anyone has ideas about this. You're looking for something like mu, uh, square bracket of mu and some spinner, such that when you restrict it uh, to a twister line on the support of something, let's say we have some delta function somewhere, we want this to become k dot x, where k is written in this way. And uh, just not been able to find a solution to this problem for non-simple uh, momenta yet. So some fiddly technical thing that's been driving us crazy for, <laughs> for, for, for weeks and weeks. Yeah, sorry, it's not a good answer to your question. Uh, yeah, oh, sorry. Uh, no, no, I mean, there's a cheap way to do this, of course, which is to have all the momenta lying in four dimensions. But, 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 but I guess you, you, this, these kinematics you're talking about are, are, are not... No, no, I, I, yeah, I want to emphasize this. Making the momentum simple does not make it four-dimensional. No, okay. No, no, you, okay. you still, so, so, so you still have, what you, what you have is a, a, a so if you, if you were simple, you just cover up this kind of little group index. It's not the little group. <coughs> and so now you have a P1 cross a P2n minus 1. So that's sort of 2n dimensions, isn't it? Is that, is that, sorry, am I being nuts? No, no, it's, uh, yeah, yeah, it's, 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 it's 2n. It inside, two, two n inside. So yeah, yeah, exactly, but it's not, okay. it's not, uh, so, so, so it's definitely better than the cheap. Yeah, 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 no, it's not, I, yeah, I want to emphasize this, it's not, uh, it's not just some trivial lift of the yeah, four-dimensional yeah. thing, it's really higher dimensional, but, uh, it's some, yeah, some, some sub-variety of the, the, the D minus two it's, sphere it's, that it's, you're it's, taking. It's maybe in some, uh, I say, maybe it's like something, uh, yeah. It would be good to understand this, yeah. I mean, uh, yeah. Have you thought about how you could cancel the anomaly on twisted space? No, so, okay, okay, so, 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 all right, uh, let me be cheeky and answer your question with a question. So, uh, so, so the, I haven't said it here, but we, we, we have a twister action for this guy. It's a holomorphic BF theory, and there's something that's cool, again, for the aficionados, is you might worry that, uh, you know, F, the holomorphic curvature of the, the partial connection on the Ward bundle is still a zero two form, of course, so the B, you have to wedge against it, is now a zero 2m minus one form. And it's valued in O minus two minus two m. Okay? What the hell is that thing supposed to course? So its equation of motion will be d bar closure on twister space. And you know, what's that supposed to correspond to under the Penrose terms? But it, it turns out that if you write that differential form in a basis, say of zero one forms on twister space, you have <coughs> zero one forms that point along the P1 directions and then along the C2M fiber directions, only two of those components actually couple to F02 when you wedge them together. And those two you can show either by giving integral formula or by doing the Beastwood spectral sequence thing. Those give precisely the equations of motion for these Lagrange multiply fields here. So I don't know if anyone else would care about this, but if, you were a, if you're a twister actor, action person, I was at least kind of surprised that this was, uh, this was, this was the case. So, but the question I have for, for, for you or for, for the audience is, you know, in 4D, we have these holomorphic BF descriptions, but of course we also have holomorphic Chern-Simons descriptions, which are very interesting in their own right, perhaps more interesting for, for many reasons. But what is the higher, I mean, you can write down higher, holomor higher dimensional holomorphic Chern-Simons theories, but they don't give you holomorphicity of the bundle as an equation of motion. Right, you get F02 wedged against some other you stuff being zero. Well, I mean, it won't even make sense as a, 
the equation, the classical equation of motion you'll get won't be the right one. He, he just wants to, the, the, yeah, the, it'll be a VF theory. Right, yeah, yeah, yeah. But no, the, the short answer is no, we've not thought about any of the kind of quantum mechanical aspects. I mean, a pipe dream for us is that you can, and that this is somehow some much more, I mean, Atul also alluded to this at the end of his talk, that the, the real playground for all of these ideas should be hyperkähler, hyperholomorphic geometry, and generic numbers of dimensions. And of course, 40, there are good reasons for caring about that, but uh, I suspect it should be possible, but we've not thought about it. You did the, here the analysis for C4M, but uh, does this for more general hyperscale? Yeah, so, so I mean, this is, at least as I understand it, the, 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 the reason why mathematicians are interested in these hyperholomorphic bundles, you can define them over any hyperkähler manifold. And then, for instance, if you have, it, it provides a way to generate quaternion kähler manifolds. So if you have a hyperkähler manifold with a circle action, there's a canonical way to define a hyperholomorphic line bundle over this. And then there's some yoga whereby this allows you to create quaternion Kähler manifolds. So, so yeah, th these hyperholomorphic bundles are robust. Uh, I've given you the flat model, but over any hyperkähler manifold, the condition makes makes sense, um, and there are reasons to be interested in it in a general setting. But uh, but yeah. But, uh, sorry, why did you mention uh, quaternion Kähler manifolds? Uh, why, why are you interested in making this? Oh no no, I was just giving you an example of why mathematicians are interested in them over hyperkähler manifolds which aren't flat. Uh, but, uh, I mean, for me, one thing you could imagine doing is using all of this stuff to con start calculating amplitudes on curved hyperkähler manifolds. This is something we've already been doing in the four-dimensional case, but uh, no one is touched in, in, in higher numbers of dimensions. This should give you some widget with which to attack that, but, uh, but we've not done it yet. I mean, there's a di slightly different mathematical interest related to quaternion Kähler manifolds. That for every quaternion Kähler manifold, there's a so-called Swan bundle over it, which is hyperkähler. Mm -hmm. so take most of the sort of uh, you, you can think about quaternion Kähler manifolds in terms of hyperkähler manifolds, where there's also a, a, an S and Q action that that moves one one complex structure to another. I see. Okay, let's thank him again. <laughs>